Good morning, everyone, or whatever time it is when you're watching this. Uh, it's morning here. Welcome to another episode of Behavior Bites. I'm your host, Gabrielle Johnson, owner of Best Life Dog Services. And today we're talking with Amy Willoughby, CPDTKA, and owner of Share Joy Dog Training. Amy has been running her own LLC for just shy of four years, which is about the same amount of time Best Life has been in business, which I think is very cool. Um, and she began actively training dogs at a local shelter under mentorship as part of the behavior staff seven years ago. She decided to make her education practice an ethos formal by passing the CPDTKA exam. And she's currently studying to sit for her behavior consultant consider, uh, certification. Her business is primarily private lessons for manners, such as greetings, leash walking, and leash reactivity. She offers group classes through parks and recreation in Gloucester County. And she's trying to be the most accessible and obvious option for that community as she's only one, uh, she's only maybe one of two force free trainers in the area. Um, and so I'm really, really excited to talk with Amy today about uh, behavior in shelter and rescue, um, where things are going, where things have been, and how it's a benefit to the whole community when we focus on behavior. All right, let's get started. Wonderful, wonderful. So everyone, we are here today with the amazing Amy Willoughby, and we are going to talk about the benefits of private trainers and community members working with shelter dogs. And I am just so excited to dive into this. So um, Amy, go ahead, take us away. Um, tell us everything. Okay, I'll tell you everything. So I like to start with how sheltering kind of fits into my behavior mo or my business model because a lot of people don't necessarily, if sheltering is not profitable. Uh, but I did start in sheltering and I started as a volunteer dog walker and um, as a behavior staff, but I went off on my own for a few different reasons that I'll get into, but my business model is primarily just the private lessons and what I'm trying to do is position behavior and um, understanding dog behavior in a way that both the shelter can benefit from the skills that we bring to the table just as veterinarians do and also the trainers um, benefit from having this wonderful opportunity to work with so many dogs on the behavioral spectrum. And then the volunteers benefit because the shelter is in essence becoming a, uh, a resource for education and hands-on demo. So it's, there's a lot of mutual benefit going, going on around um, you know, in sheltering and coming in as a private trainer, working in that sheltering environment, even if you're not behavior staff. Oh my gosh, there's, there's like just, and I know we're getting to all of it, but there's so much to unpack there and just dive yes. into. Um, I, I really love how you um, uh, just immediately talk about the benefits for everyone, right? Because I think that's mm -hmm. one of the really beautiful things that we get to dive into today is how this really is a win, 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 like five times exactly. over, six times over. This is good for the community. It's good for the dogs. It's good for you know the community at all these levels. Um, so tell, tell me more about um, bringing private training into shelters and kind of the benefit that we, that we see from that? Sure. So I really have created my own business model. So I'll speak to my own business model and maybe what I hope to see moving forward. Um, I come into a core group of regional shelters and I partner with a wide range of rescues and shelters from Pennsylvania all the way down to the southern end of Virginia. Uh, and what the way that I position myself is I come in and I can do anything from assessing a dog's behavior on behalf of a foster rescue organization that wants to pull that dog into fostering. So what kind of home do they fit in? Uh, what kind of adopters do we need to look for? Uh, but a good chunk of my business for my core local shelters is going in and putting hands on dogs, assessing their behaviors, showing volunteers how to safely handle dogs. A big chunk of it is uh, greeting manners because if we can teach these adoptable dogs how to show well, then they're more likely to get into homes. And then we also work on my core programs, my passion pieces, which are field trips, fostering and play groups. So that's really where I found I can make an impact. 
But just as a general broad spectrum, it's a lot of trainers don't want to come in and work full time in shelters. So even, you know, on your comfort level as a personal trainer or even as a volunteer, you can have that opportunity to dip your toe in to training and behavior and find out what kind of dogs you like to work with. Uh, what specialties you like to work on, whether it's, you know, crate training, whether it's leash manners, reactive dog work, that general umbrella. Um, and then, you know, there's always the fun bitey ones that I really like to work with, you know, the dogs that struggle with fear, anxiety, and stress. Um, and then the shelter environment really does, you know, tend to amplify some of those behaviors. So, you know, the shelter really appreciates us coming in um, and helping. So it's behavior is the future of sheltering. As spay and neuter programs take off and we are, you know, sterilizing a lot of dogs, we are pulling dogs into our shelters from the south or from the islands where they're street dogs and they don't cope well in city environments like New York City. Um, so what we're seeing in shelters is more of behavior cases. So we've got a good system in place to have vets come in and consult, but we don't have a behavioral network put in place yet. So we have this opportunity where our industry isn't regulated, animal welfare isn't regulated. So we can come in as the educated next generation of force-free trainers to really be the resource that our shelters are going to need, do need, and I anticipate they're going to need more of. Oh my gosh. Again, just so much, so much good stuff to unpack there. Absolutely. I think that totally mirrors what I've seen as well. And what a lot of folks um, who work really in any proximity to shelters or rescues right now are seeing, um, uh, especially we've, we've talked a lot about um, behavior change just in the years since the pandemic started um, uh, and, and how we've seen um, <clears throat> separation related behaviors or behaviors related to um, perhaps not as a robust socialization period as a, a lot of that we may have seen. And then absolutely touching on where are the dogs coming from um, oh my God, which can be an entire conversation in itself um, and absolutely right. should be. Um, I, I wonder if you would talk about how, so, so I think, gosh, I'm trying to think back to, I just listened to a podcast and I'm trying to remember who the guest was, but they were talking about um, ethical shelters and ethical rescues. And we were talking about resources. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they were talking about is you might have something, some place that has put a lot of their resources into the vet, the medical side of it. Um, and then you may have a place that has uh, the ability to put a lot into the behavior side of it. And the gold star, the gold standard is an organization that can really consider and take into account how important it is to have both the medical component and the behavior component. Will you talk more about how that benefits the community, the volunteers, the staff, the dogs, kind of everyone to include that behavior sure. component? Yeah. Absolutely. So making a case for behavior is tough sometimes when there's very limited budgets. And I really do find great satisfaction in going and working with municipal shelters, which have little to no money. They can't even fundraise. So the way that I've kind of uh, pitched it to the shelters, one, I don't try to charge an exorbitant rate. I try in all of my business model to be extremely accessible. And for me, there's an opportunity cost that pays back in addition to my hourly rate that's not very much that I get from the shelter. I see that there's a lot of community buy-in because the shelter is promoting my methods, promoting my video, promoting my social. So I see a lot of business come out of partnering with shelters. I get a lot of referrals when a dog goes out that may need some help with separation related training, uh, basic manners, you know, resource guarding. So that naturally transitions my business into not just helping prime these dogs get ready for adoption, but continuing to support them in the homes that they're going to eventually go into. So that is where it's grown my business tremendously. And in addition, it's nice to be a community resource and it's grown my business way bigger than I had anticipated, but it's 
positioning myself in a way that I am, if people think about trainers or sheltering, they think of my, my name and my company. And it's a good skill to be able to refer out. And even though I'm booming with business, it helps me network with local trainers that come to dip their toe into my shelters or seeing volunteers that have potential when bringing them on as interns and potentially employees. So it's the inherent byproduct of networking and getting to know your community and being the face of the community. And it really does tremendously build your business, but it makes the case for itself when you're able to streamline adoptions, build community support, uh, get good adopter feedback. Uh, so the contract renewals and raising my rate conversation becomes a little bit easier <laughs> as, as time goes on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love it. Just so many opportunities. And I love the focus on community and network, right? And so saying, how can we support each other? How do we how do we come into this? This is really a community effort. Um, yes, and I, I agree too. It's so interesting how more and more we're seeing behavior become, um, uh, people are becoming more aware, I think, of the role of behavior and um, and what it means for, um, for everything from uh, the dog's success, right? And therefore the success of the humans as well to have a, a happy yeah. adoption um, and community safety, certainly when we're talking about, um, we can look at things like aggression or reactivity, but even in terms of like, um, you know, uh, what's your dog's recall like? You know, if your dog gets out of the fence yeah. and is running to the street, you know, so, so it just oh builds gosh. a better community um, uh, when we look at, at behavior and of course, health, health, uh, happier dogs, healthier and happier dogs. Um, oh, I love, I love all of that so much. Um, so, yeah. And it's also um, about import, empowering the volunteers as well, because they can now get practice and then they ask for free training advice for their dogs. And not only they are working with those dogs, we can use those dogs for demo. And then they can be more empowered to feel more capable if they see that behavior again. And maybe they're teaching it back and it trickles back into the community. So it's all just, like you said, win, 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 win. Yes. You know, I think of, you had mentioned earlier how it's great practice, like whether you're working with your own dog or you have an interest in um, uh, becoming some sort of, whether it's a volunteer or behavior professional or just pet professional, the, the best way is to put your hands on lots of dogs. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and shelter work is perfect for that. And um, yeah. uh, I, I also started with fostering and rescuing, but I think where I really started coming into a lot of behavior stuff was when I was walking dogs. And we, not yeah. only did I have, you know, I was working with a lot of client dogs, but we would often go into the shelters and walk dogs. And absolutely, mm -hmm. that is that is that is how I learned how to handle dogs. In a, like, I'm a really good leash handler. Um, mm -hmm. And that's from dog walking. That is, that is, you know, that is not from like taking an online class. That is, that is not even from like practicing religiously with my one dog. That is from walking hundreds, if not thousands of dogs and seeing all of these different ways. They're such great teachers. Um, and they're shelter dogs, especially, I think, because they're not having the best time of their life right now, probably. This is perhaps not the least stressful situation they've ever been in. There's often an opportunity to help um, fill those needs and to help make them feel safer. So there's just so much opportunity um, and, and what a beautiful way to, um, uh, to empower the community to take those skills not only into the shelter, but then out into their lives. It's just, it's beautiful. And it's, you're one of um, uh, very few force-free trainers in your area, right? And so I want to make sure the people listening really understand, too, that what we're talking about is often taking this entire paradigm into these places, right? And so it's, um, it's, it's not just coming in and saying, hey, the way our dogs behave matter, but say, hey, the way our dogs feel matter and the way that they explore the world and we meet their needs matter. And so you're really bringing like this message to people and changing the way that they perceive their relationship with dogs is really what I think you're talking about um, when you bring that out. So I really want to highlight that point because it's um, it's it's so much more than what it might sound like on the surface. Oh, it's uh, it's a cultural shift, you know. It, in a, a lot of these shelters, you know, I joke, it's pits and hounds, pits and hounds, all about the pits and hounds. And, you know, I have a bully breed and I have a hound. So I have a, a nice smattering of the representation of what I work with here. 
but it's lack of money, lack of opportunity, lack of exposure. And that's it. It's just, we have this wonderful platform to really utilize these spaces to teach our, teach the community, learn ourselves, get hands on practice, build up those hours for your certification because you're going to need them um, to really make an impact and also create the space that we want to see for these adoptable dogs that we're eventually going to be working with as private trainers. We need to be the ones that come in and, and make sure that these dogs' lives are enriched, you know, the, their freedoms are being met, which is why play groups and field trips are such a huge piece of what I do. Being able to take these dogs off site, off property, like that's the good behavior assessment or even fostering when our dogs are in foster, we can actually see what a dog looks like after that decompression period. And hopefully that's the future of sheltering where a lot of trainers are supporting rescue organizations and going out to foster's homes so we don't have to house these dogs by the hundreds in big buildings and tiny cages where their needs, needs may not be able to be met because there's lack of funding, lack of staff, um, you know. So it's, it's a nice opportunity to kind of shape the future and behavior and sheltering the way that we want to kind of see it, so. Oh my God, it's just huge. It's just huge. Um, so if I, um, if I am a community member and I, um, I am interested in um, uh, working with dogs or maybe I already work with dogs, maybe I volunteer at a shelter, um, and I want to, um, uh, I want to bring more attention to behavior. I have some ideas to implement, maybe in, you know, um, degrees of approximation. So maybe I just want to start talking about enrichment or, you know, where, where would you suggest someone start that? Con and I hope it's okay to, we didn't discuss this question. So I hope it's okay to lob it at you. <laughs> um, uh, no, it's okay. Lob. Suggest that start? <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Uh, where does that conversation sure, start? So where would you start it? So I was such a noob as a volunteer dog walker and I have, I am such an introvert and would like, don't rock the boat, but this was something that I was passionate about because it's this unique bonding thing that all of us that love animals have this ability to kind of step out of our comfort zone to advocate on some kind of way. So first I just want people to acknowledge that like, trust your gut it's always better to like voice your opinion. If you think there's a good opportunity for a dog's life or cat or a ferret or any small critter's life to be improved upon, it should be approached as a way to, Hey, how can we come together and improve this? And typically from a community person standpoint, you do want to reach out to the people that have hands on. And sometimes that's the shelter director. A lot of times for me, it's the kennel staff. It's the people that put hands on dogs and I'll ask them, who is this dog's favorite person? And then I'll go find that volunteer because hardly it's staff, unfortunately, because they are cleaning, they're squeegeeing, they're doing that hard pooping, scooping. Um, and the volunteers are really where the hands get on the dog. So I'll look for that dog's favorite person. Um, but if I'm looking for resources, I normally ask a director, what trainer or training behavioral resources do you have? And as a trainer looking at sheltering potentially, I normally reach out to any kind of behavior staff or behavior coordinator or operations manager because behavior staff is few and far between. Um, volunteer coordinators are really great resources so they can point out the volunteers that have a little bit more background in, um, in behavior and dog behavior. I love that, I love that, love that. Yeah. Um, one of the pieces I thought that you just said that was really cool was really how to approach it as a like, how do we as a team improve mm -hmm. the dog's life? So finding that common ground um, where I think sometimes, especially as emotions can run high and we all care really, really a lot about the dogs, it can be easy sometimes. Um, I think I know I'm guilty of this to like come in and say, okay, this is wrong. And now we are going to do the right thing. Um, and we all know that doesn't go over well. And I think as a fellow person who likes to avoid conflict, sometimes we go, well, I'm not doing that, you know? And so I love right. that, um, you know, that thinking of it and saying, okay, no, there's, there's actually a way to come into this where it's, it's not based in conflict. It's not based in, Hey, you're doing anything wrong. It's not based in like, 
even I think sometimes in overwhelm, like, oh my God, there's so much that we need to do here. You know, that feeling of like when you get information and you kind of go on overload and you're like, well, we need to overhaul the entire system. And then of course your brain goes, well, that's not possible. And so again, that shut down. So I love that like team approach. This isn't just like one person's job. This is a community effort um, brought in and really, really important pieces of that team being our, um, our behavior folks our medical folks are, but saying, we really need to look at the behavior side of this. It's a huge piece of the puzzle. Let's do this collaboratively for the the unified goal of helping the animals. That's fantastic. It is. It's idealistic because I realize that in most nonprofits or organizations or even training industries where we're sometimes very solo and very hustle, 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 and in our own lane, Working in a shelter is a really quick way to build up your customer service skills as well. And I think in addition to the strategic and business aspect of going off on my own independently, as opposed to working full-time as a behavior staff, you know, there were business reasons I did that. A lot of that was compassion fatigue and on my own. And like knowing that I had these dogs that I was working with full-time five days a week and Silas was one of them. And I needed to also address not just the dog behavior element, but also to make sure that as coming in as professionals, that we approach behavior in a way that's empathetic to the humans that love and care for these animals. So compassion fatigue is a big piece of what I'm trying to do and making sure that we're not judging uh, the people that bring dogs in, that we are thanking people that return dogs is and saying thank you very much for this information and it's that's not just a lesson that's unique to sheltering you I I went into a customer's house last night that had their German shepherd unexpectedly on a prong collar and immediately launched into the dominance theory and how he had to teach his dog to be alpha and those are the moments as a trainer where when you're really green you're like (laughs) And in the shelter where you're dealing with all of the personalities and different behaviors, uh, you get really quick and really good at remaining pragmatic, practical, scientific, and maintaining really good customer service skills. So it all kind of circles back around to the dog and the human element. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really important to consider because a lot of times folks will say, oh, I work with dogs because I don't like working with humans. Um, And I think more and more we're becoming aware of how almost impossible that is. They're, 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 dogs are domesticated animals. And so there are inevitably people wherever the dogs are. And I think, you know, you touch on such a really great uh, concept or, um, a prevalent mindset, I think that sometimes there can be um, uh, a lot of shame and blame on both sides of when we look at community and then sheltering sometimes or community and rescue, Mm -hmm. there can be from both directions, a lot of, um, especially when it comes to behavior um, and especially there can be such a misunderstanding of behavior. Um, uh, You know, I can think of like a few different things off just examples off the top of my head. Like for example, um, you might have an adopter who says, well, the, the dog did this and the shelter like didn't tell me or the rescue didn't tell me when maybe they didn't know because it's a different environment. But that misunderstanding of how behavior works can create this total misunderstanding. Well, the rescue was doing something nefarious by not telling me when really the rescue just didn't have that data. The dog hadn't been in that situation. Um, Or we might have um, a situation where um, we... um, Um, Okay, so we had a little recording glitch, everyone. So I'm just going to like recap my last sentence because I'm not sure where it stopped hearing me or if it stopped hearing me. So we were talking about kind of the conflicts that can um, sometimes occur uh, through misunderstandings um, to kind of like an at conflict community versus rescue or community versus shelter. I gave the example of um, someone might say, oh, the, the rescue or shelter didn't tell me that the dog might behave like this when really it's a misunderstanding of behavior. The shelter or rescue may not have seen it. And to your point of that's why getting them out in real life settings and getting them into foster homes can be so beneficial because we're going to see behaviors that we wouldn't see in the shelter for better or worse. A lot of times dogs are like, oh, thank goodness you got me out of there. Now I can be my best self, you know, or, or that sort of thing. Um, and then the other direction, we might have like a shelter rescue that says, you know, oh, X, Y, Z wasn't a problem until the adopter did this or, you know, they should have tried this or that sort of thing and a lot of shame and blame. And so I love the 
God, it's just such an important piece of it to say, um, no, we're, we're working together. We are on the same team. Um, and, and yes, please bring the dog back, you know, please give us the information that you gathered so we can better help this dog. Um, you know, uh, please ask us these questions and for people to be able to say, Hey, I'm having a problem with this dog. Um, can you help me? Can you give me more information to reach back out and see the shelter, the rescue as a, as a support? you know, and the, the trainer as a support and the, you know, everyone else involved playing their role so that we can really work together to best support um, the, again, the dog, but also the whole community. Um, it's just gorgeous. Sorry, I just paraphrase everything you said, but. Um... Okay, so yeah, I had this uh, exact same scenario play out this morning. So I got a message from the shelter director saying they're having some difficulty in the home with a dog that was like bomb proof at the shelter, a little walker houndy mix. And uh, in calling him after a few months when he started to decompress and feel better, not only was there significant body defensiveness at hand, but there's also resource guarding. So we were able to determine that the dog did need to come back because there are young kids in the home and we could find a better fit for this particular dog. And we thank, I thanked them for their, their fostering and they offered to write a bio and send in all the pictures, which means that that dog is now much more adaptable than, and with more information, I should say, about his adaptability moving forward. So it's a sad situation, but knowing that we can come together to help make sure that these dogs find the best home and best placement, it's, it's our responsibility and it's just something that we can do to help make sure that these, the community feels supported. And um, it's, you know, if a adopter feels comfortable calling and getting the support that they need, then that's going to build trust in rescue and sheltering for the long term. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I do want to say too, something that, um, that I, want to make sure that folks know is that as we're talking here about behavior and working with behavior concerns in shelter dogs, um, that we're not saying that every shelter dog that you meet or adopt is going to come with resource guarding or some, um, some big behavior concern. Um, right. uh, what we're more speaking to is all dogs need behavior support. Um, and so it's, I think, an opportunity too for that. I just want to make sure we're really clear on that. It didn't, um, it didn't occur to me until just now, but I want to make sure folks have that context that when we're talking about supporting a dog behaviorally, we are talking about potential, um, and, and Amy and I perhaps are more likely to be talking about potential issues like resource guarding or aggressive behaviors, reactivity, which we also see in dogs who come, um, you know, from breeders or from, from any number of backgrounds. Those behaviors are not, um, are not special to, uh, to adult dogs, to adopted dogs. Um, yeah. and Thanks all for dogs, that call out. Yes, yes, no, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Because I'm just my I know what we're talking about. And yeah. then I'm like, how is this going to sound? So I want so when we're talking about behavior, kind of that nuance is all dogs need behavioral support. And as we've kind of alluded to in that um in the the importance of context and environment, is that um when we're talking about behavior any dogs can exhibit any range of behaviors, and that's more likely if they are misunderstood. Uh, so people aren't understanding their body language or their needs, or people don't understand how to meet their needs, their, their needs as dogs, right? Um, uh, and so that's when we tend to see these conflicts erupt. So not necessarily that we're saying um, dogs in shelters have severe behavior problems that we will need an entire team to address, but that we are saying that all dogs deserve that behavior support in the same way all dogs deserve medical support and may have varying needs. Um, but we should we should go to the vet and get checked out. You know, we should um, uh, we should uh, um, uh, we should make sure that we can, at the very least, understand and meet the needs of the creatures that we're, we're interacting with. All right. I'm going to do the call to action and we're going to we're going to get through this. We got this. We got this. We got this. We're having all the technology issues. Amy. <laughs> People are listening to this right now and they are now empowered with all of this information and the importance of behavior um, in sheltering and rescue. What would you like them to do now? Okay, so if you're a community person, it would be a great opportunity to sign up as a volunteer and just dip your toe into whatever kind of tickles that kind of interest, uh, whether it's medicine, enrichment, 
walking dogs, stuffing Kongs, right? And enrichment. And if you're a trainer or thinking about getting into vet tech or med at all, like it's a great opportunity to plug into a, a learning school is the way that I like to think of shelters. Just it's a network to learn, to teach, and to start that journey and figure out what your specialty is, even if it's just a launching off point into what it is that you actually want to do as a trainer. I love that. I love that. I love that. I just want to like absolutely second that just from personal experience. Again, there is just no better learning school. I love that phrase. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Amy, yeah. thank you so, so much. I am so excited. Um, I really appreciate you being here today. And I am going to share all of the links that you've provided down in the description so people can find you and follow you and keep up with what you are doing. I really, really just thank you again for everything that you're doing for our communities and for being here to share today. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. And um, one of the greatest joys of my career has been all of the shelter dogs at the end of my leash that have gone off at a home. So it's my pleasure. And hopefully I'll see you guys in the play yard sometime. Well, I love that. <laughs> <laughs>